It's been, oh, a few weeks since we covered a somewhat recent release from G-Kids. And you know what? We've been covering some pretty heavy stuff. So let's cover two issues here. Let's jump back into the G-Kids Animu party, and let's take a look at something more uplifting than our recent deep delving fare. What's on the docket that we haven't already taken a look at from their catalog? Let's see, let's see. How about A Letter to Momo? The 2011 yokai-fueled anime film concerned with coming of age and learning to live with one's family and environment. Alright, who put another one of these sentimental movies on the list? A Letter to Momo is, as we said, a 2011 film produced by Production IG, who are one of those anime production houses whose series or films you've likely seen if you've been paying attention in the past 20 years. This film concerns a young woman, Momo, whose father has recently passed away. Momo and her mother journey back to Shiojima, where her mother's family home sits, and which her mother states she hasn't visited since before Momo was born. It's also notable that Shiojima was the location of meeting for her and Kazuo, Momo's father. Without the bustling life of the big city, Momo has to find new ways to entertain herself, and stumbles upon some relics in the attic. Among these is a book containing illustrations of a group of rascally yokai. By breaking the seal on this book and potentially through her loneliness, Momo summons the three primary yokai pictured. The remainder of the film deals with Momo coming to terms with the passing of her father, while also coping with the three yokai making a constant ruckus about town. The film is striking both emotionally and visually, lending itself easily to the sentimental tone one might expect of a story like this. A Letter to Momo was written and directed by Hiroyuki Okiyoda, a long-running animator who has previously worked on numerous major projects. These include Akira, Pot Labor, Blood, The Last Vampire, Cowboy Bebop the Movie, I accidentally put Cow Booty Bebop in the script and had a really hard time not leaving it that way, Paprika, and Evangelion 3.0. Okiyota, even if you don't know him by name, is one of the big booty boys. And you would be forgiven for not knowing his name, as Okiyota has only directed two films so far, Jinro, The Wolf Brigade from 1999, and A Letter to Momo from 2011. Having worked for so long, whether or not he's helmed a ton of projects, it's clear Okiyota has a pedigree for quality. In this case, he favored a quaint slice-of-life story rather than a sci-fi special effects bamboozlement. A Letter to Momo is, as you may expect us to say, something that is better experienced than explained. If you're interested in the description we provided earlier, we would encourage you to go check out the film for yourself and laugh and cry on your own. On the other hand, if you've seen the film previously, we have two main discussion points. The film seems to be primarily concerned with the natures of family and history as they relate to Momo and her mother. In that way, we would like to take the remainder of this video to examine how A Letter to Momo deals with Momo's relationship to her deceased father and to herself, as well as how the film explains Momo's place in history. First up, we have the film's take on Momo and her family. As we said, Momo's father, Kazuo, is deceased. This would be bad enough for Momo if it weren't for the fact that her last interaction with Kazuo was a fight. So not only does she have to deal with him being gone, she also has to work through the guilt of being mad at him just prior to his death. The long and short of it is that Kazuo was a marine researcher who frequently missed dates with his daughter. After one too many rain checks, Momo told him not to come back when leaving for an emergency at work. Momo saw Kazuo in life as self-absorbed. At the same time, she can't help but miss him, and keeps his final memento and gift to her, an unfinished letter. The problem with the letter? Well, it's literally only addressed to her, leaving Momo to wonder what Kazuo might have meant to say. We see through the presentation of this letter that Momo is dealing simultaneously with resentment and grief. On the other hand, Ikuko, Momo's mother, has an understandably more nuanced perspective on Kazuo than Momo does. Her take on the recently passed man was that writing research papers was like breathing for him. For this reason, and because she and Kazuo had lived together for so many years, the two had a mutual understanding, one which a child wouldn't be expected to have where Ikuko and Kazuo were able to develop their relationship naturally over time, Momo was literally born into it, meaning that she can develop her own expectations. 
Her father, being distant and busy with work, is her baseline, and she can hope for more. Given their prolonged relationship, on the other hand, Ikuko understood that Kazuo needed his work in order to survive. Which, relatable, am I right? The irony with Kazuo being this way is that, through the presentation of his final letter, we learn that while he could write research papers all day, he didn't know how to write a letter. Which, relatable, am I right? This is seen with how the letter is ultimately unfinished. Further complicating the issue of Momo fitting in with her family is how lonely she appears outside of her parents. As we're shown soon after Momo and her mother moved to Shiojima, Momo can't fit in with the local kids. Her mother may have come from Shiojima, meaning that this is a homecoming for her, but Momo is a city girl, meaning that this small town life is utterly foreign to her. And this isn't for lack of trying on their part. The kids actually seek to include her in their local hijinks, namely base jumping from the main bridge in the town. Given how scared she is, and how emotionally distant she's become, however, Momo can't bring herself to jump. This scene is bookended with Momo walking home in the rain, where she encounters a trio of yokai. Again, given her emotional distance from those around her, Momo believes she just has to act tough, and quickly overcomes their spookiness. Through bonding with the three, like we said, the bulk of the film following this point, Momo begins to overcome the loneliness inspired by her father's loss. On top of their growing bonds, we see that she is not alone in being capable of seeing the yokai, with other children knowing about them and being able to communicate. By necessity, this means that Momo has a new group to be a part of, if she'll accept it. Speaking of Momo's new family members, we have the yokai themselves, Iwa, Kawa, and Mame. Initially, these rascals seem entirely self-interested, causing trouble for Momo no matter how much she pleads with them. Their job here is to report on Momo to the sky, and they keep this job separate from their budding friendship with the young woman. In other words, when Momo offers them friendship, the yokai slowly overcome their issues and hardships to become empathetic toward humans. At the same time, Momo develops a handful of genuine connections, meaning that she can begin to overcome her loneliness. In fact, the parallels between Momo and the yokai run deep, with one of them able to see non-yokai spirits. Though not obvious initially, this makes him different from his companions, just as Momo is unique from her peers in being able to see the yokai in the first place. Lastly, in terms of family matters, we have Ikuko, Momo's mother. Ikuko only makes relatively small appearances throughout the bulk of the film. In the second half, however, she gets tied directly into a feud between Momo and her yokai friends. One of the yokai breaks Ikuko's mirror, and Momo is understandably distraught. She doesn't want to hurt another parent, given how recent everything with her father was. Momo gets so upset, in fact, that she seems ready to excommunicate the yokai responsible for this mirror's breaking. Ikuko, on the other hand, cares only really for Momo's health. She comforts the girl, saying that there's no need to worry about the mirror. Here, we learn that, in order to keep Momo safe, Ikuko has chosen to play the part of the strong parent. Unfortunately, this has had the unintended effect of further distancing the two. Momo, not understanding what her mother is doing, accuses Ikuko of forgetting her father. It's only through actually communicating this that the two can learn to work together again. However, at the start of the film, they're at odds without even realizing it. In terms of history, the film also has a bit to say, with this theme in one case tying back into family matters. The film, for all its whimsy, holds some cultural context, a comment on Momo's family through the years, and a general statement on time and history. First up, we have the historical culture part, this being Toro Nagashi. Toro Nagashi is a yearly festival held throughout Japan, usually at the end of the Oban festival itself a yearly gathering meant to honor the deceased. The obon contains a number of customs, most notably the bon odori, or bon dance, a group dance meant to communicate with the dead. Toro nagashi being the cap to the obon is when participants see their ancestors off. It's believed that during the obon, the spirits have come back to town to visit, and that toro nagashi is held in order to help them find their way back to the afterlife. In order to guide the spirits, paper lanterns are floated on the water in a mass, leading the spirits. 
we see this festival within A Letter to Momo, showing how connected Momo's family is with their home and the traditions within Japan. Further connecting Momo and her mother to the past, we have the relics the family has collected in the attic of the estate. As is explained, Momo's great-grandfather collected books about yokai from Edo, the earlier name for Tokyo. Thanks to this habit of collecting books, the events of the whole film are sparked, releasing Kawa, Mame, and Iwa from one of Grandpappy's old tomes. These yokai also hold a bit of history themselves, showing that they didn't just appear out of nowhere. Speaking to Momo, they claim that they were kami, powerful spirits, who have been demoted to yokai. Thanks to their demotion, they say that they're bound to the island now, a similar situation to that found in Okozin. These spiritual appearances are hauntings, but not in a negative way. As it turns out, the yokai claim they were defeated in combat by Sugawara no Michizane, hence their demotion. Now they're obsessed with oranges and tangerines, or mikan. Given their low rank, the yokai were made to eat what was offered back in the day. Now that they are once more freed, the trio have retained their taste for these sweet fruits, offering another link between the present and the past. The man who defeated the three, Sugawara no Michizane himself, was demoted from the Heian court and exiled to an island in Kyushu. Following this exile and subsequent death, many disasters were visited upon Kyoto, causing quite a bit of trouble for the court. Believing it was Michizane's active spirit, the emperor restored his official ranks and offices, and deified him under the name Tenjin. Oh, and that's not the deep lore of the film. All of that actually happened. What we're getting at with all of these historical and cultural notes is that the film seems to argue that some things never change, no matter how much time passes. You've got the yokai loving their citrus fruits, Momo's dad's rigid writing style, her mother's strong, often distant nature, and Momo's inquisitive nature and friendliness. No matter how much time passes, these things don't seem ready to change. The yokai will still seek out oranges. The letter from Momo's father will remain incomplete. Her mother will try to be strong for her, and Momo will try to make friends even when hurting emotionally. On the other hand, other things that aren't as intrinsic to us can change. While terrified earlier in the film, Momo can learn to jump on her own from the local bridge. Her mother can learn to be less distant from Momo, and the yokai can learn to be empathetic toward their new friend. We're shown these immovable and these elastic qualities, and then shown that the ending is up to interpretation. The film seems to argue that we have to pick up and move on no matter what we come up against. In this way, A Letter to Momo handles gracefully the questions of growing up, losing someone close, and learning to live with your family's past and legacy. It's a sentimental project with a unique art style that is deserving of your attention, whether a fan of anime or slice-of-life stories. If you haven't already, give this one a look, and let us know what you thought of the film.